Yes, hello. Um, I'm going to jump about a bit here. I'm going to talk about why we have to criminalise nuclear war. Why it's absolutely imperative. Um, and to do this, I'm going to show you a few slides from some presentations that I've, I've, I've made in the past, but they're from different presentations, so I have to jump about a bit, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. The first picture that you see here, this one, is from a paper by uh, uh, Robin White, who is a paediatrician in, in Canada. This paper was written in 1990 and published in the British Medical Journal. And to my mind, it's one of the most terrifying graphs um, imaginable. Because what it shows is infant mortality and first day neonatal mortality. So these are children who died at birth over this period of time. This is 1940, 1950, 60, 70, 80, you can see. And, and um, this is in the United States. So this is first day mortality, 0 to 28 days, and stillbirth rates for the United States. And what you can see quite clearly here is that there's a big increase in babies dying after being born. In this period, that's 1952, to 1968. Now what, what could have happened then to cause this uh, enormous increase in, 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 in child death? What happened was that there was a lot of atmospheric nuclear testing of weapons. So the United States and the Soviet Union and the United Kingdom uh, and later on the French uh, and of course the Chinese, but mainly the big testing from the, from the, from the uh, Soviet Union and from the United States produced an enormous amount of radioactivity which came down in the rainfall all over the world. And the effect of this was to cause genetic damage, cause damage to the, to the babies uh, in the womb and to cause damage to the genetic material in the sperm and in the eggs of, of, of women who were living at that time. And as a result of that, probably, and if you include also the miscarriages, these are, these are children who died in the womb, you're talking about maybe 50 million deaths. So if we're talking about World War II and World War I and World War III, I have to say that World War III has already happened. World War III happened after World War II. And World War III was not a fight between one nation and another or several nations and several other nations, as World War I and World War II was. It was a fight between the military and the nuclear complex and the human race. And it's not me who said this. The person who said this was John Goffman, who originally was the head of research for the United States Atomic Energy Commission until he had to resign. And he said that the nuclear industry is waging a war against humanity. And that war has already been won. More than 60 million people have died of cancer as a result of these releases to the environment of radioactivity. And as I said, probably more than 50 million children have died either in the womb or, 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 or as this shows, postnatally. And not only that, but of course not just human beings, but of course you've got all of life living systems on Earth. So you've got an enormous reduction in the birth rate of just about every species. Um, one of the scientists that I know, um, an Indian scientist called Edward Ashja, looked at the, uh, the, the mortality of larval stages of the edible mussel and also the, the, the ragworm. This is a worm that lives in the river. Um, and, and forms a, a, a basic food supply for, for, for sea for, for, for seabirds sea and also for fish. And he showed that tiny, tiny quantities of these radionuclides released from the atomic submarines in Plymouth were capable of causing developmental defects, chromosome defects, in the larval developmental stages of these creatures. So, so what we see is that already, as a result of these releases to the environment from, from these atomic tests, which, um, we have had an enormous increase in deaths in the developmental stages of living systems on Earth. Now these were just tests. These were just blowing up bombs in, in the sky. 
uh, these weren't nuclear exchanges. These weren't the um, weapons that were being fired from one country to another to explode over cities and kill millions of people, which they would do. These were just tests. And if there's any doubt about these effects, let me say that I have already also studied the, the veterans of these nuclear tests in the Pacific. I carried out a study in 2007 of the British Nuclear Test Veteran Association, children and grandchildren. Um, and what, it, what, what this result showed was quite astonishing. We, we did a questionnaire study of these veterans of the nuclear tests in the Pacific in, in, in Christmas Island and in Australia, and we found that there was a tenfold excess of congenital malformations in the children. So that is to say that the children had ten times the congenital malformations. These are, these are, these are sometimes fatal ones. These are ones that involve hydrocephalus and heart spina bifida and too many fingers and uh, missing kidneys and all sorts of very nasty ge genetic effects. In, we found a tenfold excess in the children uh, over the expected number uh, uh, com compared to ordinary people uh, who, who were not at the test sites. And of course we should also note that the ordinary people who weren't at the test sites still suffered an effect. But the astonishing thing was that it was not the children that was the, that was the most interesting thing or the most horrifying thing, it was the grandchildren. Because the grandchildren had the same level of congenital malformations. And studies that we've done in Fallujah, Iraq, uh, of people who were exposed to radiation from uranium, from depleted uranium weapons, show exactly the same effect, that the children and the grandchildren, and we have no doubt the great-grandchildren and so on, will suffer these same genetic effects. Now this should come as no surprise to the scientific community because in 1926 Hermann Müller discovered that the um, irradiation of fruit flies, these little, little flies, um, with x-rays caused a massive increase in, 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 gen in genetic damage, uh, in, in visible damage to the chromosomes. And, and he bred from these flies and he showed that they produced mutations, so you get mutated flies. That's a fly, instead of having long wings, it has little wings. Instead of having red eyes, it has black eyes. Um, so these are changes in the structure of, 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 these, of these creatures. And, in, and by 1950, he, he, he had received the Nobel Prize by then, he was sufficiently concerned to start writing articles in which he said that if nuclear testing continued, and if radioactivity continued, and this is Hermann Muller, this is a Nobel Prize winner in America, he wrote these articles to say that if these releases to the environment were continued, there would be an ongoing, continuous effect on the genome, on the genetic structure of the human race. And he was very concerned about this. He got into a lot of trouble with the United States government for writing these things. But he was an important enough guy to be able to get away with it. So we know from this work and from the work that, that, that other people have done on the genetic damage resulting from the exposure to these substances, and I'm talking about strontium-90, cesium-137, plutonium-239, uh, uh, and in fact indeed, and, and especially uranium-238, which although it's not a new substance, has actually become a new substance on Earth because it's been dug out of the ground where it should quite safely be and it's been refined into the metal, into the pure form, and then it's been used in weapons, in atomic weapons, of course they're all made of uranium, uh, and in uh, these depleted uranium weapons or in other uranium weapons that are increasingly being used on the battlefield. So this is the effect on the children. Now I, um, in, 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 the, uh, in 2004, I was uh, made the work policy uh, leader for a, a European Union operation called the, the Policy Information Network on Child Health and Environment, or PINCH, P-I-N-C-H-E. And I made a little presentation there about all of this um, to the 40 scientists and doctors and epidemiologists and toxicologists and pediatricians who were part of this group. And the purpose of the group was to advise the European Commission, these are the people who run the show in Europe, on what they should do to try and improve children's health. 
Uh, and because children's health since, since the 1950s, since the Second World War, has actually been deteriorating in many ways, although we've, we, have, we have massive developments in, in the ability to cure certain diseases, and of course we have the development of antibiotics and so forth, there are a lot of diseases that have increased in children which are really um, quite alarming and nobody knows the cause. So the, the European Commission is understandably quite concerned about this and wanted to know whether the, these, uh, these uh, increased levels of illness, and of course that includes childhood cancer, were, were a result of exposure to substances in the environment. And of course we, 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 we at the end of this discussion we found that that was the case, that they were, that they were a result of, of um, exposures to these substances. So anyway, so I won't go on too much about that, uh, except to say that there seems to be some sort of mismatch between what is administered at, at, at the structural level, at the, at the, at the, um, the, the government level, and what, and what science actually tells us, if we bother to look, um, what's happening. Because after all, I mean, what we see here is 50 million dead children. I mean, if you said to somebody uh, in the European Parliament or in the European Commission, what you are doing is causing the deaths of millions of children, I mean, they would have to stop. I mean, th this is a human rights issue. You can't, you, 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 the, the universally accepted position with regard to human rights is that you cannot kill people. 50 yeah. million? That's right. That, if we're t 50 million, if we're, if we're talking just to, um, just the miscarriages and the infant mortality, that the calculation for the infant mortality has already been done. I was going to go on to talk about, this is the European... In, in which area, 50 million? In the world. Yeah. This is global, global, but mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, because the Northern Hemisphere is what took it. most of the fallout was in the Northern Hemisphere. And in fact, you can see the variation between uh, levels of illness and, and, this, and this sort of effect. You, all, you, all you have to do is look at areas where you've got high levels of, of fallout because of a lot of rainfall and areas where you've got low levels of fallout. So one of the first studies I did back in the 90s, and I published this in, in the British Medical Journal, was to compare the, um, the cancer effects in areas of high rainfall and areas of low rainfall and, to, and also to look at the infant mortality effects in high rainfall and low rainfall. And I published that in a book called Wings of Death, which, I, which, I, which was funded by the Joseph Rantry Charitable Trust, and which I published in 1995, and sort of started me on all of this. So this is a long time ago. I mean, Ditter said 10 years. I've been doing this since about 1990, maybe 1992. And my initial conclusions were published in Wings of Death in 1995. Well, it's now 2015, so that's 20 years ago I've been doing this, 20 years of this stuff. But, uh, but I, am, I seem to be winning, actually. I seem to be winning in some sense. If I survive long enough, maybe I'll see, I'll, I'll see the nuclear industry and the military brought low. And, and that is I, the instrument on your stomach, and, yeah? Yes. And in, in, um, I'm going to give another little talk in this series about war uh, in terms of the military and in terms of the structures that support the whole system of war and the system of the military and so forth. And that's really another matter. But in this particular um, little talk, and I won't go on too long about it, all I wanted to do was to persuade you that we have already had the Third World War and the first, Fourth World War, which, which, well, which I'll be talking about, which will involve a serious exchange of these nuclear weapons, will actually result in the deaths of all things on Earth. Because according to Professor Yablokov, who knows about these things and who's a colleague of mine on the European Committee of Radiation, on Radiation Risk, if you get a destruction of 11% of the genome, then, then, then you have destroyed the species. Because the, breedings, the, the breeding ratios and rates are such that you cannot get replacement once you get to that point. So once you've increased the, the, the destruction of, of the developmental stages in other words, the genetic, the genetic uh, structure of any species, more than 11%, and I mean, maybe that's not, maybe that's 15%, maybe it's 9% different with different species, but it's that sort of thing. So you don't have to wipe it all out. They found from the cod that once, you know, the famous disappearing cod in the, in the Atlantic, that once you get to a certain point in terms of the species, you, get, you, you, don't, get, um, you don't get replacement, there are not enough replacement uh, creatures, and that's the end of the species. 
So what else have I got to say about this? You yes. started holding this book for two minutes older yeah. about it. I have, I have to say one more thing about this. That, the, that, that, that if, if the Third World War has been fought and lost, the people who've lost it, are we, we're talking about the human race, the people that won it are the scientists who work for the nuclear and military establishment. Because what they did in 1952 was they created a radiation risk model, um, which was a false model, which was a model based on averaging of exposures. And as a result of this, they managed to sustain, and this is why they did it, the nuclear testing without being stopped by, by, by the, the governments who were engaged in it. They advised the, those governments that the, 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 the testing uh, would, would have no effect on people, no effect on, on living systems and they were completely wrong. And the evidence of this emerged uh, around about 1980, the first evidence of it, although this was published, early, early results here were published in 1972 by my colleague Ernest Stoneglass, who died last year. But that model, would it be right to say that it is <clears throat> some kind of uh, device to measure damage of uh, radiation? Well, I can explain what the model is. Because the, people the, don't get it really, you know. The, it, well, it's, it, it is easy to explain. Let me just show you some pictures. So that blue book, it, um, it describes perfectly that model, yeah? Yeah. The device with which you can predict right. the consequences of radiation this, this exposure. Is, this is the basis of the model that was developed in 1952 by the International Commission on Radiological Protection. And this is, the, this is the organization that still holds the reins of the radiation risk model that enables people to live, enables laws which limit the, the doses of radiation in such a way that people can be exposed to, to more radiation, than, you know, to, to quantities of radiation that actually kill them. Um, and this model averages radiation over the whole body. So in other words, you, you take the amount of energy that's absorbed and you divide it by the mass in the body and you call that a thing called the absorbed dose. That's the dose. The problem is that if you get all of this energy in one phase, say here, let's say let's put it here, then, you, then, then the dose will be much, much smaller uh, un, under, the, under the ICRP risk model. So if you put a bit of energy here and, not, and nothing everywhere else, you dilute this energy into the whole system, you see. The problem so is you mean a, a one contaminated place yes, if you in the body? If you had a particle, for instance, if you had a particle here, just there, say let's put it in the lung, particle. I'll show you a picture of the particle in a minute. Then what the ICRP model does is it takes the energy from that particle and it dilutes it into the whole organ. Um, the whole body? Well, the whole body sometimes, but basically it is the whole organ. So, so it, it, um, and the, But the organ is very large. Yeah, I mean the, I'm not talking about a, 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 a massive dilution. Let's see if I can find the picture I want. No, I don't. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay, this one. Well, I'll leave it up like that. If you can see here, this is this is this is an edible muscle. This is like one of the, like you know like when you eat mussels, moon and in marinière. These 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 creatures they um, they filter the water. And as they filter the water, they can pick up little particles. And if you look here, you can see a particle there. I see if I can. This is slide number 24. So let's see if I can get this slide up, as we can see it there. there. So you see these little blips. These are alpha particles that are being released by a small piece of uh, radioactive material that's been filtered into the um, into this creature. I mean, people eat these. You, you, if, you're in the, if you go to, say, Northern Ireland or somewhere like that, or Carlingford, then you can eat mussels, and they will put them on your plate, and you will say, oh, this is delicious, yum, yum. But if it contains one of these things, then that will get inside you, and that will produce a big, a big amount of energy in a very small place. Now, if it was the ICRP modeling that, they would take that energy and they would dilute it into the whole organ. In this case, the organ would be the colon, would be the gut. So you would have a very large organ. The colon weighs about 10 kilograms, if you took it out and weigh it. And in fact, they have. So you have these numbers. And so they take that amount of energy and they dissolve it and, and they absorb it and they dilute it into 10 kilograms. 
But the problem is that the, the mass of the, of the, of the uh, organ, the, the piece of the colon that gets irradiated, is very likely to be about one thousandth of a gram. So you've got the, so the difference in the in the absorbed dose to the tissue that's important is the ratio between ten kilograms and one thousandth of a gram. So you can see that that, that, the, that the risk model is completely wrong for internal radionuclides. And interestingly, um, two days ago. I won a case in um, Australia of a test veteran who um, had applied for a pension. He was dead, so his wife was applying for the pension, and they refused to give him the, the pension. And then we appealed it, and I, and I made these arguments, and we won the case. And the judge said, it's quite clear to me, the judge said, and this is a big breakthrough, that the ICRP model where they dilute into the whole of the colon is completely wrong since cancer starts in one part of the colon and not in the whole colon. And so this is like a real breakthrough for us to have a judge in Australia to, 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 to identify this point or to go along with it. So we kind of won that. Anyway, so that, that, that concern about the radiation risk model was addressed in 1998 by a new group called the European Committee on Radiation Risk, ECRR. And in fact, I don't know if you can focus in here, but you can see this is a model here. This is a computer model, in fact, of, I'll come over and show yeah, you. Yeah, 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 we can it. it. This is a computer model um, made at the University of Ulster by my student, Andreas Elsaesa, of a uranium particle. And it shows the way in which the, 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 the energy is all close to the particle. And if you're far away from the particle, you know, you'd be lucky to just get one of these tracks. These are electron tracks. So you can see all the energy is close to where the particle is, just as here in the muscle, in this, this um, electron micrograph, you can see that all the energy is close to the... So it damages the yeah, tissue. Another one there. So it causes a high level of dose to the, to the genetic material in the cell, to the DNA. And that, and that is the, the origin of cancer, and it's the origin of the destruction of tissue and the origin of all sorts of effects, including heart attacks and strokes and um, brain tumours in children and so on. I mean, at the moment, brain tu tumours in children are, have increased to the level that the, that the, the rates are greater now than, than leukaemia. Leukaemia used to be the great childhood cancer, but now it's brain tumours. So... The, so the ECRR recommendations, and if you get this book, and it's a free download on the internet from www.euradcom, E-U-R-A-D-C-O-M dot org. We made it a free download after Fukushima, because of course the other, other source of radionuclide pollution is uh, these, uh, these accidents, like the Chernobyl accident uh, and the accident uh, at Fukushima, where we will see an enormous increase in cancer and other causes of death. So that, that brings me to the final point I want to make, is that, as I've already said, this is a human rights issue. It is a human right to live in, a, in, in, in an environment which, which is not going to cause your death, or the death of your children, or the death of your grandchildren, or genetic damage that will lead to all of those things. And as a result of this, it's possible to address governments, and in the case of Europe, address the European Parliament and the European Commission, in such a way that this issue of the health effects of radionuclides is re-examined on the basis of all of this new research, and on the basis of overthrowing the, 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 the simplistic research and the simplistic ideas that led to the risk model which is currently in position. ICRP. The ICRP risk model. That's right. Now, in in the European uh, Union, the the uh, limitation, the limit of exposure is is defined legally by the Basic Safety Standards Directive 9629, which has been updated recently. But it's basically the same, the same directive, the same legal structure and legal framework, and it's based on the ICRP risk model, the false risk model. And since, since uh, Chernobyl, there have been enormous amounts of data and scientific research carried out and, and papers published that show that this model is false. Now, the, the European uh, Parliament, advised by me and my colleagues, by Rosalie Bertel, me, Alexey Yablokov, and Alex Stewart, 
they managed to get a clause into the basic safety standards that said if anything new scientifically comes out that shows that the, the risk model on which this is based is false, then it has to be re-examined. And, and there is a structure within the European Parliament that, for, that enables people to demand that this is the case. And so what, they, what people have to do, anyone listening to this or interested in, in really changing the world, what you must do is you must go to the website called www.nuclearjustice.org where you will see all of these issues relating to human rights um, laid out and, and various uh, versions of this um, petition uh, which you can download and sign and then send to the European Parliament and also send to your own radiation protection people in your own governments. So finally then to sum up, what I'm saying is this, is that we already know that very small amounts of these radioactive substances kill people and kill living systems and therefore for that reason uh, and for the human rights reasons and for all the other reasons that I've, that I've, I've, I've presented to you it's absolutely imperative that we, that we make nuclear wars illegal because a, a, a real nuclear war will destroy everything on Earth. And we have to, we have to make sure that the, that the uh, radiation risk model that is in place um, shows the generals and the people that, who are talking about nuclear war and, and, and saber-rattling and saying they're going to shoot all these missiles all over the place, that if they do so, that such a war cannot be won. Such a war will result in their own deaths and the deaths of their own children, and not just those of the enemy. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Busby.